So what have we learned? That a delusion is an idea. That an idea can be contagious. That human beings are pattern-seeking animals. By which I mean we prefer ideas that fit a pattern. In other words, we don't believe what we see. We see what we believe. And when we are stressed or our beliefs are challenged, when we feel threatened, the ideas we have can become irrational. One delusion leading to another and another as the human mind struggles to maintain its identity. And when this occurs, what starts as an egg can become a monster. I'm sure many of you recognize the omniscient narrator from Legion. His various clips played here often and part of a theme I've explored since civilization broke down in utter madness last year. The show Legion is about mental disease, collective and personal. Just as at its core, the Nag Hammadi Library is about mental disease, too. Personal and collective. Yet the Nag Hammadi Library and other Gnostic Gospels go further and deal with cosmic mental disease. Like Stephen Davis said in my book, Voices of Gnosticism, the Gnostic story is simple. God went crazy and became us. Look how he spends his time. 43 species of parrots. Nipples for men. Slugs. Slugs! He created slugs. They can't hear. They can't speak. They can't operate machinery. I mean, are we not in the hands of a lunatic? Yet in this Philip K. Dick world, this surveillance magician state, where the infectious empire is more deranged than ever, they have switched contexts and definitions to the point Orwell is turning in his Fabian grave. As Evelyn Underhill once said, sanity consists in sharing the hallucinations of our neighbors. And as C.G. Jung said, show me a sane man and I'll cure him. Do you know what crazy is? Crazy is majority rules. Yeah, uh. You freaks and outcasts, you of the broken places, you high priests and priestesses of Sophia and Hermes, see through all of this double speak and see the collapsing of lucidity across the nations. You've lost your mind, but come to your senses. As Caitlin Johnstone wrote, the only thing keeping the world from plunging into total insanity are those few who are insane enough to doubt its sanity. And as Robert Anton Wilson said, Of course I'm crazy, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. You know about the themes we've been covering at Aeon Byte. What you should know is that I included the summary of the omniscient narrator of Legion, <coughs> John Hamm, because this show is our 15 year anniversary. You heard it, 15 years. Even if in truth, I really didn't go full time until late in 2018. Pushed by a crisis and spirits who beckoned me to rise higher into the stratospheres of heresy. Regardless, I've been doing this for 15 years. Ever since Robert Price was my first guest in the spring of 2006. And here we are at the end of a world of reason and sound thought with the Joker and the Thief, wondering if there is some way out of here. I think you know we do have a way out. 
and we have learned together here at the virtual Alexandria. To quote the great Joseph Campbell, he said, it is by going down into the abyss where we recover the treasures of life. Where you stumble, there lies your treasure. To the ironic twist of the unknown. Thus, in this special show, we will be dealing with the curing of madness from a collective personal and cosmic stance. For this, we have the honor of having Monty Oxymoron, keyboard player for the legendary punk band The Damned. He will be discussing his new book, The Cosmic Brain Explodes. You could say this speculative and autobiographical book is Monty's coming out of the Gnostic closet, his gospel and his myth a radioactive Gnostic slash hermetic expression, but also a perceptive work exploring the fragmented human psyche and how to heal it with both alternative and spiritual methods. <gasps> Welcome, Monty, to this age of Hermes, and we need more Knights of Valis in this Black Iron Arkham Asylum. I mean... Yaldivaldi is only getting hornier and making us all the inmates from the movie Sucker Punch or the poor FBI chick agent from Alan Moore's Necronomicon. They have created a repressive society and we are their unwitting accomplices. Their intention to rule rests with the annihilation of consciousness. We have been lulled into a trance. They have made us indifferent to ourselves, to others. We are focused only on our own gain. And perhaps the Demiurge is the cause of all of this. The great mind parasite infecting humanity for ages. Bringing us to our knees while he feeds off our divinity as in the Gnostic myths. I read Grant Morrison's Nameless early this spring. A wonderful Gnostic nightmare. I like this passage. Now, consider the possibility that we've always had a disembodied alien life form living among us, invisible yet able to occupy minds and alter them. It hides in plain sight, everywhere. The mind boasts of its own omnipotence. It informs us that we are no more than than submissive instruments of its will, then deliberately wills us to defy its rules? All the while, it vows to punish every preordained breach of those rules, however brief or minor, with eternal, agonizing torture in a cosmic concentration camp. What name might we give such an omnipresent evil the answer is God. You're talking about God. Oh, you like to think you're a God. You're not a God. You're just a parasite eaten out with jealousy and envy and longing for the lives of others. You feed on them, on the memory of love and loss and birth and death and joy and sorrow. So, so. For all Aeon Bite listeners, you know how bad it is and how high we must fly with our wings not bound by wax, but by the tears of Sophia and the laughter of Mercury. It's bad, but we of the broken places eat nervous breakdowns for breakfast, and no eternity hasn't gone anywhere. You are an eternal champion, and I have contended that Gnosticism is actually the most positive philosophy out there. I just fucking kill myself. I've been so fucking depressed. Tony? Sorry. Sorry, go back to bed. Oh, no, no, what? What now? It's all big nothing. What is? I've... Everything's black. 
Seriously, it is. Let me quote Jeremy Puma in his book this way. Listen, Gnosis tells you that the world sucks, they really are out to get you, and you don't know jack about anything. Anyone who tells you anything different is trying to get you in bed. Sure, there are benefits to Gnosis too, but if what you're hearing about Gnosis sounds like the work of some enlightened being, or it makes your BS detector start to twitch, or it makes the author look good, you should probably take a step back. And his scholar Edmund Lupieri said, Ears to hear and eyes to see. That is the tragic ability of the Gnostic. There's only one hell, princess. The one we live in now. Sorry if there are meat sacks listening right now that are ass-clenching because they want to stay with the official narrative of the creator gods and their catamites and Karens in the establishment. But I know things are always good when my eyes and ears are open, when I'm awakening. Things are great, actually when I can sense the hidden sparks everywhere in this broken Sephiroth. It's not a tumor. I am eternally grateful for you who keep me company on this journey here in the desert of the real on this anniversary of sorts. Thank you. It's better to burn out than to fade away. We live. We fight. And we die for each other. As a gift, I'll provide two bonuses that relate to our interview with Monty. One is with Tobias Churton, sharing on the Gnostic leanings of John Lennon. The other is with Gary Lockman, who, like Monty, addresses the idea of the bicameral mind and other alternative theories on why humanity is batshit crazy these days. You'll love both bonuses, I say, I say. As a further gift, I will provide the complete interview and bonuses to everyone. I hope you enjoy and appreciate and begin or continue to support. Because the shows will only get weirder and more interesting and always relevant for the rest of the year. I shall continue to inspire you so you may inspire others. And together we teach the world that divine mania, that wild madness Plato talked about, instead of being eaten by the massive mind parasite that is Yaldi Baldi. Well, it was nice to meet you, God. Thank you for the Grand Canyon, and good luck with the apocalypse. Oh, and by the way, you suck! Let us to our interview with Monty Oxymoron. Let us into the dark mazes of insanity and the treasure, hopefully, the rain. There is a maze in the desert, carved from sand and rock. A vast labyrinth of pathways and corridors, a hundred miles long, a thousand miles wide, full of twists and dead ends. Picture it. A puzzle. You walk. And at the end of this maze is a prize just waiting to be discovered. All you have to do is find your way through. Can you see the maze? Its walls and floors, its twists and turns? Good. Because the maze you've created in your mind is itself the maze. There is no desert, no rock or sand. There is only the idea of it. But it's an idea that will come to dominate your every waking and sleeping moment. You are inside the maze now. You cannot escape. Welcome to Madness. This is the A.M. Byatt interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Monty Oxymoron to discuss his new book, 
the cosmic brain explodes and hopefully a lot about uh, music and spirituality including uh, his band the damned monty thank you very much for coming on and giving us your time and gnosis well thank you very much it's, a, it's an honor to be here very very excited to have you on and with us too we've got the moon dog vance sachi vance how are you today Oh, I'm good. I'll be damned if I was going to miss this one. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably damned already since you've gotten into those pesky Gnostics. So. Oh, yeah. Heretic. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Well, Monty, I thought uh, before talking about your book, uh, you and I had a small conversation about music and Gnosticism. And I've always been uh, kind of surprised why there's not more any Gnostic themes in uh, popular music, contemporary music, and hoping I've got I completely have like a blind side that I've missed my own ignorance. And we, I talked about Tori Amos and her album, The Beekeeper, which is uh, directly inspired by the Nag Hammadi Library and Elaine Pagel's The Gnostic Gospels. You mentioned a song by Kate Bush, uh, do you see any other Gnostic themes in music and rock music, punk, or anything else that we might have missed or that you can think about? Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, I, I, I think of a lot of the music, the, the music of Arthur Brown, you know, the, the God of Hellfire. I'm the God of Hellfire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, good yeah. Band. Uh, a lot of his uh, themes are very, uh, very Blakey in, in places. We actually, I've had had conversations with him about this, and indeed, he is into wearing Blake. Oh wow! Uh, but certainly, he had a band called um, the Kingdom Come Band, which was after after he had the Crazy World, the hit of the Crazy World of Arthur Brown, and they had some definitely had some Gnostic uh, themes in there. And also, my uh, the, another musician I was, I was I was privileged to get to know as a friend was David Allen of Gong. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you know about Gong, but uh, Gong is an incredible sort of syncretism of of, uh, of mysticism and music, also with with uh, surrealist humour and uh, all kinds of other things in there. And uh, I think David Allen also, like William Blake, forged his own uh, uh, mythology so as not to be imprisoned by anyone else's. Although it was a very it was presented as a very kind of silly uh, <laughs> mythology, <laughs> lots of also flying teapots and potted pixies and things like that. <laughs> but the ideas underneath, behind it, were were really serious ideas. They were serious, based on um, uh, Buddhist and Hindu concepts and all kinds of things, uh, Sufism and all all sorts of stuff. So as I was privileged to get to know David Allen, so I would I would count David and and uh, Arthur Brown as as among the Gnostics certainly. And then uh, thinking about the the damned themselves, I'm thinking of the song uh, "I Just Can't Be Happy Today." Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, but there's a, a monologue in the middle of there, which sounds very much like the 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 sort of uh, demiurge, archon controlled <laughs> kind of system. You know, the everything's everything's darkness is in power, and, and uh, yeah, the, so the, there's an element there as well. I mean, the dark, the dark, what I would call rather than the gothic, perhaps the dark romanticism of the damned. Uh, there's there's that element there too. Isn't there a song, you guys have a song called Antipope? That's right, yeah. Captain, well, it's actually Captain's brother who wrote, Captain Sensible's brother wrote that. Uh, yeah, because as a result of uh, being brought up Catholic and, and falling <laughs> away from from that. <laughs> I don't think it has specifically Gnostic elements, but definitely sort of um, against the, the, the dogma of the established church and the power of the church, of course. Yeah, I mean, obviously, rock and roll and punk and all these movements uh, rebel. They're antinomian. They rebel against uh, normative systems. So you have a little Gnosticism there. And I know in so many of the the metal bands of Scandinavia, like um, uh, my friend Anders and his band Draconian, how could I forget their music is so wonderful, uh, definitely deal, definitely go deeper into these Gnostic themes, uh, in rock music. Obviously, Jung was, uh, Jung was a big influence on a lot of musicians. David Bowie, I think is, might be the, the obvious one. He was very much into, um, Carl Jung and he had uh, devotions to Sophia. He was aware of the Gnostic Gospels, uh, 
Uh, John Lennon, before he died in his last interview with Playboy magazine, called the Gnostics the true Christians. And uh, you have plenty. Uh, Elvis Presley, people don't know, he read the Gospel of Thomas, and he was a theosophist. So it seems <laughs> to be uh, scattered there. And, and then you think, then you have to kind of look at other places like Jethro Tull, Bungle in the Jungle, which seems to be... Uh, uh, a call against the demiurge and how he sets up the system of nature and other things. So it, it is out there, but it's not as you might say prevalent in as you find it in science fiction and other places. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, someone, someone should write a book about it. I think, I think uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of, I, re I remember some, there, there was uh, the, the Gnostic philosophy, the book, um, uh, that they, he was he was exploring. Oh God, what's his name? Tobias uh, Churton. Yes, he's yeah, been Tobias, on the show. Yeah, I'm Wonderful just looking man. At it, just looking at it across, but my eyes are too uh, too blurry to to see from that distance. Uh, but yeah, he was exploring that a little bit. But I think you, they they should be a lot more explored about the richness of the counterculture. Uh, I think it tends to be in discussions. Of, I think I was, we were saying this with uh, with my publisher Andrew. We were saying that. Uh, it tends to get ignored in these discussions about uh, culture in general, in general about uh, romanticism, um, modernism and postmodernism. It doesn't tend to get mentioned that there was this great resurgence of what well, I would call it romanticism mm -hmm. uh, in the counterculture. And it doesn't tend to get recognized or acknowledged. And I, I think it should be. Oh, I agree. Again, something to uh, really explore and i always find it ironic uh, obviously carl jung was influential for many musicians in the 60s and 70s william blake is always a huge influence on so many artists because his wonderful poetry but he is very gnostic and i always find it ironic monty that william blake is considered england's poet uh, here in the united states it's robert frost and both were very influenced by gnosticism so it's ironic right. that it's hidden in plain sight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I must, I must get to know Robert Frost better. He was a, a favorite of my friend David Allen's. He, he really rated him, and I don't really know his work. I must explore it more. Yeah, I wrote an article. I'll send it to you. It's uh, definitely you. been written by scholars that he was directly. I mean, he has a poem called "The Demiurge's Laughter." So he was very. Uh -huh. Very interested in that stuff. And uh, Vance, uh, what about you? Are there any music you consider Gnostic that we've missed? Um, no, you uh, rattled off so many that I think <laughs> I'm out of them. I always think of Genesis, though, because you like in the Foxtrot album and so forth, where right. they were heavily into the biblical things, and it wasn't necessarily traditional. There was some sort of um, overarching eeriness about it. That I always, and of course we have the carpet crawlers. You mentioned that right. all the time. Got to get in to get out. So that's that's what I think of. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I can think of another. More recently, there's a band called Secret Chiefs Three. I don't know if you've come across them at all, but they're they're kind of that of that circuit around um, John Zorn and uh, those people. Oh wow! Uh, in the nineties, and they were a very interesting band. They're definitely quoting stuff from Gnosticism, so they're worth checking out too. Secret Chiefs Three. Fascinating. Well, it's something we should explore in the future and see if we can find more. But you are right. Tobias Churton does deal with this in his book, Gnostic Philosophy. I know he brings in Jimi Hendrix, but I'll have to, uh, I'll have to go reread that passage right now, but, uh, yeah. it is there. And, um, uh, what about, and do you feel, um, did the dem really deal with spirituality in general? I mean, you were also saying, you're also telling me, Monty, you're like, well, I'm releasing this book which is uh, the cosmic brain explodes, which is a, a treatise or a Gnostic expression. Uh, and your fans might be, you think they might be a little perplexed by it? <laughs> yes, they might well be. I mean, the the, the dam started out, as you, as you may well know, as the, one of the first right. uh, punk bands, you know, the British punk bands, first one to release an album and a single. And back then it was like real uh, high intensity rock and roll stuff. I think the first album is is a great rock and roll album, uh, but there's no keyboards on there. Obviously, I wouldn't have joined them if I <laughs> if they continued in that in that vein. But the the music kind of evolved and changed, 
And uh, Dave Vanian, the singer, has always been, you know, a gothic figure or has kind of dressed up as Dracula or, or right. as a, you know, other uh, themes from, from movies, gothic movies. And so I think that would, that would bring in, to me, my mind would bring in, as I say, the theme of dark Gnosticism, uh, dark Gnosticism, dark Romanticism. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. So, I mean, the, the Gothic novel and, uh, and all of that, that sort of, you know, Frankenstein and all of that uh, from, from the uh, Romantic period, which obviously relates to, to Gnosticism. I mean, in, in Blake, the, the imagery is equally dark and light at the same time as images of beings of light and beings of darkness and uh, some of it is very you know very demonic demonic in appearance uh, so i mean a lot the the later damn stuff did become it became more kind of themic more filmic more uh, imaginative uh, and gothic in nature and i suppose that kind of attracts kind of got goths to <laughs> to the to the fold uh, but my my thing i was i was always attracted to the psychedelic element in it i could definitely detect that there was a 60s sort of psychedelic vibe in there to the music i knew that you know sid barrett was uh, was a big influence on captain sensible and uh it was that to me i suppose psychedelia uh it, it has a gnostic element in the sense of a nostalgia with a G, maybe uh, for <laughs> for out there for something beyond, you know, something in the the, the echoey music of the early Pink Floyd. I used to right. it used to take me places. You know, I was very young when I heard that music first. But my uncle had a pirate radio station in the sixties, and he played it me when I was a kid. And some of it, it would just take you up there and out there, whether it was into outer space, literally, you know, in the sense of explored by Sun Ra, another great visionary or whether it's inner space you know an, a, a, a spiritual cosmos the the pleroma which i mention a lot in the book i use the word pleroma a lot to refer to that uh, just a calling to something something beyond something more something extra uh, they, there's some element of that i think in psychedelic music and uh, there's an element of that in the damned as well no, I would say so too. Yeah. And for the audience, there's also a band I like. Uh, I think they're from Northern Ireland, VNV Nation, and they openly admit using Neoplatonism and Hermeticism in their work. So if you have a chance, um, check it out. And it's interesting too, Monty. I was, uh, I was doing some research on, on the damned and then I sort of went down a rabbit hole. You know how the internet is. You click here, you click yeah. there and suddenly tabs are opening. And I, I was, I did, I was reading something about uh, the band, uh, Killing Joke. And I had no idea that the lead singer, uh, what's his name? Laz, uh, oh, I'm drawing a name. I'm getting today. I, for some reason, I can't pronounce name. Uh, Jazz Coleman. He contends that rock and roll was created by the Tavistock Institute in the early sixties, the big sort of, uh, it's kind of a conspiracy theory here in the United States that the CIA created rock to manipulate the masses and all that. And we have somebody in a, you know, a, a famous band actually promoting this. But then I was thinking, like you, I loved uh, Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd, as much as I liked uh, everything else. But uh, then I was thinking, you know, Sid Barrett, even when he came out, he was considered a musical genius, an innovator, uh, somebody who was breaking new ground, who was going places. It was pretty much agreed. And then he had his breakdown and he was replaced by David Gilmour, who's somebody who's also as much of a musical genius in his own way. And I was thinking, what are the odds that you can do that? I mean... Do you ever think about that? It's like something from heaven or maybe something, <laughs> or are we going to get conspiracy, something from the CIA laboratories? I mean, what are the odds? Oh, well, I, I mean, I hope it's not, uh, there is this, there is this sort of current that we're looking for uh, hidden negative messages and, and everything. But I think there is that, there is that saying birds of a feather fly together. And I think there, the band sometimes do form out of incredible characters. I'm thinking of the Bonzo Dog Band, the people who went into that, uh, and the people in Gong. I mean, they were talking about the, the mix of, of um, astrological signs in Gong was incredible. You know? uh, it just sometimes happens like that, that people attract 
uh, are attracted or attract each other. And in my case, I, I was a damn fan and I listened to, I was listening to the stuff. And when they, they brought out an album called Strawberries, it had a lot of organ on it. And I was listening to it and I think, ah, oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I, I wish, I wonder, I wish I could have a chance to play with these guys, you know. So I made a natural wish, you know. And, uh, well, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what happened. You know, maybe it came back. <laughs> Uh, certainly, I'm sure that wasn't the CIA, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was, you wouldn't know, right? Unless they give you a signal and then you go like a Manchurian, Manchurian <laughs> candidate or something. No, but you're, I think well, sometimes yeah. manifestation and connection and how the universe draws people together is just as good as a, a reason. It seems to happen a lot. So I think that's, I'm kind of exploring that in in the book in terms mm -hmm. of the way things are put together so i mean we we now from modern science we know that unlike the ancient gnostics didn't really know what matter was they talk about it as very as, as solid stuff i guess so as the lowest uh vibration you know some stuff that pulls you in and, and holds you there they didn't know that it was basically when you look down into it it's basically space and energy but I suppose I'm talking also about the way that things are put together, the patterning of things. You know, sometimes there is just a pattern in things. There's that song, um, it ain't what you do, the, the way that you do it. It's something to do with that, I think, the way things pull together and the, the great mystery of that. You know, if we, re if we could really uh, see into that and understand it, we would, we would understand a lot more about, about where we are, I think. Yeah, well said. And self knowledge and knowledge of the world. And, uh, so tell us about the book, uh, The Cosmic Brain Explodes. How did you, uh, you and Andrew Phillip, uh, get in touch to publish this really good book? Oh, okay. Uh, that, that was, yeah, synchronicitous, I guess. <laughs> I was, uh, as you probably, as you know, um, Andrew, uh, produced the Gnostic magazine, which is a fantastic publication. And I was, I was, uh, totally addicted to that. So I was reading that, and I saw it, there was a review in there of uh, about the old, the the dam's old drummer Rat Scabies, who was in search of the Holy Grail, and uh, he wrote a book about this. Uh, I, I think that that the main reason for searching for the, old, the Holy Grail was financial rather than uh, anything spiritual. But you know, <laughs> who, who am I to say? I don't know. If uh, if I if I see Rat, I can ask him. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I saw this. <laughs> review and i wrote into the magazine uh, to andrew and i said well actually do you know i'm i'm in the same band now you know and we got we got talking through that and it turned out that he was a fan of of the damned amongst a lot of other music as well and we just got to know each other put him on the guest list when he was living in ireland to come to see us in uh in dublin and yeah we got to know each other that way Wonderful. Yeah. Andrew's been on the show many times. He writes excellent Gnostic books. He is a publisher of my two books, Voices of Gnosticism and Other Voices of Gnosticism. So we love what Bardic Press is doing to promote this uh, ancient heresy and all the other subjects that Andrew uh, puts out. And uh, we're looking at you and maybe we can discuss your journey and how it came to uh, manifest as the cosmic brain explodes, but, uh, uh, your book talks about, uh, the first part talks about your ideas and other, uh, notions. And then the, the other part is you, your, your Gnostic expression, if you would, uh, which I really enjoyed. It's, uh, it's poetic. It's enthralling. It, uh, certainly harkens back to texts like the secret book of John or the gospel of truth. But one thing that struck out to me, Monty was, uh, you uh, were raised by a spiritual mother and an atheist father, and that is exactly how I was raised. My dad was an atheist, my mother was a devout Catholic, and I think, uh, like you, I said, well, these are fine, and I thought, there must be a middle way. Is that how you were, too? You said there must be a way that goes in between these two uh, spectrums. Yes, definitely. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's complicated. My my, my father, <laughs> bless him, he was, he was a, a professor of of he studied the history of ideas. So he was he was studying the history of of, of you know he would 
a lot about philosophy and about how ideas like Darwinism have affected society and stuff like that. And he wrote a book eventually called The History of Histories, which is a, it's a bit of a big bestseller, is quite, quite well known. Uh, but he was always always an atheist, and I was always trying to sort of explore further things with him, but he, he wouldn't have it, you know, he was definitely, no, no, it's determinist, it's, it's a atheist, you know, that that's that. Um, but while at the same time being open to all this amazing ideas, you know, from around the world as well. Uh, so he, I mean, you know, I'm grateful to him in, in having this appreciation for history and for, for the ideas and how different ideas interact with one another um, through history. So they, there's, that's his world. And then my mother was as like your mother for what was, was a devout, a devout Catholic. Uh, and, um, she used to read me portions from the Latin mass. She was very much into the Latin mass. So that I knew what the, the symbology of that was. And she read me Tolkien as well. As my father introduced me to the world of mythology via Wagner. He's very into Wagner. So the ring cycle and all the Norse mythology that that's, that's uh, steeped in. And, but also gave me books on, on uh, Greek um, mythology as well. So all this was sort of fermenting in, in my mind. And then my, when I was a teenager, my mother was actually converted to a more, uh, how can I put it, more fundamentalist uh, religious system a very fundamentalist literalist interpretation which was much more involved in the bible because as a catholic we didn't really study the bible i didn't really know what was in it i mean i knew <laughs> i was interested in yeah i knew i was interested in the book of revelation i kept dipping into that I thought, wow this is interesting this is wild stuff you know <laughs> uh, Re revelation and uh it's psychedelic uh, it, it's very yeah psychedelic. <laughs> you see revelation ezekiel uh daniel and those kind of those kind of parts but i i didn't know what the bible was as a whole so uh so everything kind of became more uh pulled apart you know between my parents and th there was a lot of uh, trouble and a lot of uh, difficulty it was like two polarized worlds and trying to find my own way in the middle of that was was very difficult i mean originally i just went along with my mother and was accepting uh her you know, the teaching that she had and then as a result of experiences of getting into nursing, I um, I found I couldn't. It was no longer tenable. It was no no longer sustainable for me to to stay within that. But I didn't want to go completely my father's direction and go into the the, the realms of Richard Dawkins and and, uh, and that lot and right. say, oh, it's all rubbish. It's all crap. <laughs> you know, everything spiritual is rubbish. Everything the everything in the phenomenal world is exactly as it appears to be, and that should be enough for you. Enough of this. No fairies at the end of the garden. Why not? I like fairies. <laughs> fairies are great. <laughs> <laughs> my, my friend David saw them. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he might have been high, but so what? It's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a, that. Certainly was yeah. My experience too, and uh, somehow my parents made their marriage work in those days. Um, what? Uh, when did you start becoming interested in other uh, thinkers, or what were some of the influence that would later change your your worldview? Well, I suppose um, already my uncle was a big influence in playing me all this music when I was very young. So he played me all Pink Floyd and, and Hendrix and Captain Beefheart and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, later we started talking about books and things as well, comic books. We were well into comic books and, uh, in, you know, imaginative stuff. So he introduced me to the world of H.P. Lovecraft, so he's another uh, mythological oh, creator. Yeah albeit very dark, <laughs> uh, and also the works of Carlos Castaneda, who was also a big influence uh, on me at that time. That was I was very interested in in that stuff. Uh, and I suppose I, you know, while I was feeling kind of imprisoned in the literalist biblical interpretative world, I uh, started. I think the start off really was was the Tao Te Ching. It was um, Chinese philosophy. <laughs> Because the my mother's um, my mother's paradigm was very much of saying whether you, you everything else 
apart from the Bible, is 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 bad and evil and not good, <laughs> and influenced by the dark ones and all of that. And so I was reading the Tao Te Ching. I thought, how can you say this is evil? <laughs> this is a evil at all. This is incredible. You know, it's just completely about nature and about the mystery of nature. Right. Uh, I mean, in a way, opposite to the Gnost- the early Gnostics, in the sense that they they tend to see nature as a trap uh, and a prison rod. But you know, this was about the mystery of na- the nature and the the power in it and how it works. And I just thought it was wonderful. It it, it started me off exploring things, and then yeah, later we've already mentioned Jung, but Jung was my my hero as well. When I got into psychiatry, uh, I really got into Jung in a big way. Well, yeah, and I know you, yeah, your influences are, well, if you bring in Carlos Castaneda, if you bring in William Blake, if you bring in Rumi, uh, I think mm-hmm. automatically you're into Gnosticism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've been initiated in some way or another. <laughs> yeah, but, but also I, I mentioned in the story at the beginning, the introduction to the book about there was this, I used to visit this, uh, woman who had, who had astral, travel and this this was back in the time when such things you know were not trendy and you know he didn't he didn't know what what this was you know perhaps she, she would uh have these visionary journeys like blake would and would draw uh, amazing pictures of them she drew a nature spirit that was living in the garden and she would draw these uh amazing uh buildings uh, uh with lions carved out it carved out of a stone full, filled with with honey and stuff like that you know amazing stuff and i used to like going along and talking to her and showing her my pictures and uh that sort of intimacy of showing artwork and and uh ideas led to me getting into art therapy later on uh but um eventually after a while my mum said oh no you shouldn't go there anymore they're they're um you know they're, they're inspired by by dark things so so i didn't go there anymore and i missed it you know and uh yeah it, it spoke to me on some level and i've always envied i must say i've always envied people like her like blake like Rumi, like ibn arabi uh who have this natural capacity to to have visionary experiences you know they don't have to take anything uh to induce them they just like that you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not that yeah. I've, you know, I haven't explored, people will probably be surprised by this, but I haven't explored uh, psychedelics very much at all. As I'm saving it up for later. <laughs> you know, when I'm, when I'm old, if I, if I get to 80, I'm definitely going to take acid. <laughs> uh, but it is opening up. I mean, the people are talking about serious exploration of these things again, along with all the explorations of the brain that is, is so amazing now the uh, technology we can look inside brains and see what they're doing while they're alive i'm very much into neurology very interested in that and together with that hopefully that's opening up a new resurgence in psychedelic therapy and, and research which i think could be very uh, useful and beneficial oh i agree with you a hundred percent here some states in the united states now i think like virginia and other places you can use mushroom for therapy so hopefully it will expand and yes i think uh, i was talking to andrew and you're very much into left brain and right brain science like ian was it ian mc i'm terrible with names uh, the, <laughs> the captain Gilchrist, and his yes yeah, the captain and his emissary book <laughs> yes yes i mean that's a fascinating book. i definitely think people should read it because it uh the, the it seems to explain the whole thing of how we uh reduce the world and uh, get rid of all of the mystery and, and beauty and everything out of it because our left hemisphere which is also where language is mostly situated. And uh, it, it, it's the part of the brain that makes maps or, or uh, images of, of reality for us. I mean, it's very useful. It's not a bad thing uh, at all, but it needs to be kept in its place. It needs to be balanced by the more bro- broad focused right hemisphere. And the, the left brain is... It, the, the left brain, you could almost say the left brain is the demiurge. Right. I mean, I think that's kind of where I'm getting to in 
I hadn't actually read that book when I wrote my book because that was a few years ago I was writing that stuff. But it, some of it, it does sound like a parody of the left hemisphere, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the demiurges world. You know, I am God and you know, this is it and <laughs> how I make it, you know, because we do, we're not direct in contact with reality we are uh, at the mercy of having to make representations in our brains and so the left hemisphere is very good at codifying and uh, making that into a procedural uh, process and it's in danger of of just just getting rid of all the uh, all the interesting bits <laughs> uh, <laughs> making it too tidy too too um too technological yes i mean uh, i think technology very useful very wonderful thing but very again very left-brained uh and we're in danger of 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 imprisoning ourselves in our own uh, creation or our own recreation or representation of of the world yeah the the mind forged manacles of william blake yeah. i think that's <laughs> it and exactly oh yeah i'm sure Blake would have been on a had a hate field day about technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you start reading uh, Carl Jung, and of course, uh, Jung very influenced by the Gnostics, and you start seeing the ego. The ego is not bad, but the ego disconnected from the source, the pleroma, the wisdom, and all that. That is the demiurge itself. And uh, did you ever start? thinking monty when jung is talking about complexes ego and shadows you start wondering well as we human beings are we just all schizophrenic and have uh disassociative personality disorders do you ever wonder about that well the gilchrist suggests interestingly that schizophrenia um could be created by capitalism you know, he's saying that it didn't really exist before the industrial revolution people went mad of course and, but the madness was probably more of the kind of bipolar uh, rather than schizophrenia, because schizophrenia is a very dissociative disorder. It's one where, I don't know, best people could be caught in the trap of the left brain and are un, un, uh, to the extent that they're unable to, to relate to other people. I mean, I spent a lot of time, uh, as a, I'm, a, I'm a psychiatric nurse myself, I think we mentioned that, yeah. And uh, I, uh, I was very interested in in psychosis and read an awful lot of the of the literature on the psychotherapy and psychoanalysis of uh, psychosis. And I, I used to love the, the business of talking to people and finding uh, finding meaning in what they were saying because it's I think the worst thing for a psychotic person as it is for a person with dementia and the people I work with now, is being cut off from everybody else's reality because everyone else thinks you're nuts and they, and they can't understand where you're at. So whenever I was talking to these people, I'd be trying to find patterns that I could understand within what they were saying, but also to always thinking to myself, what would it be like to experience this? What would it be like? to have these thoughts these experiences and for everyone else not to understand you know is incredibly isolating it's like being in a permanent nightmare of your own brain's own right. creation so it's 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 really important for people to to make space for for meaning uh, in people's when people are talking like that and especially now i mean dementia is so much more common than schizophrenia is, uh, any of us could get dementia, any of us at all. There are different sorts of dementia, and it is, it's just it's just possible for any of us. So we really want people to uh, yeah, to even be on younger our people, forties, fifties can get dementia. It can do, yeah, yeah, it can happen. So uh, you, we, we at that point, you really want people to to be on your level as as a person to understand you and the way you experience what it is you're going through is what we call person-centered care in nursing uh just really understanding the person's perspective what it's like for them to be cared for uh not not you know trying to adapt to them and not 
to adapt them to us. I mean, for a dementia person, who you know, who wants to be reminded that it's 2021? I mean, <laughs> for God's sake, you know, if you're if you're living in 1978, yeah, stay there. <laughs> it's a lot better. Disco <laughs> <laughs> or punk, yeah, definitely <laughs> or punk. Or in the 60s or wherever, you know, if you can support someone to live in whatever space headspace they're in, let them be there. You know, this is, as long as it's not causing danger for them or other people, there's no problem with it. Yeah, it reminds me of the story where Carl Jung was uh, treating a lady who believed she lived on the moon, and she would just he would talk to her, a patient, and she would say, I live on the moon, I live on the moon. I think uh, uh, Jung's uh, uh, second-in-command, Maria von Franz, I believe was her name, was like, oh, so this woman believes she lives on the moon. And Jung said, no, 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 she lives on the moon. That's how we approach it. Because like you said, mm -hmm. he was approaching her reality first. And by doing this later on, he was able to cure. She was able to become, you know, lucid. I had a little, a little glimmer of that working in when I was, um, um, when I was studying art therapy, I was working as an agency nurse from place to place and I was in a um uh place where where people were who had psychosis were it was like halfway house, there wasn't wasn't a hospital. There was a woman there who told me she was dead and she said to me, wow. It's not bad being dead, you know, it's <laughs> it's okay, you know and and I said, Oh, okay. Uh is there any way of coming back to life? And uh, light, her eyes lit up and she said, Yes, drink water and she went got herself a drink <laughs> of water which is a lovely little uh, you know uh, if you if you stay with the person with the imagery and you take it seriously, it can it can really you know do stuff. It's good. Yeah, I would say so too. Fascinating, yeah. and of course, being dead is very gnostic, right? The the, the being asleep. Right, yeah, when the gnostics say the, dead, the, I mean yeah. you're just asleep. <laughs> yeah, or dead to one, dead to one thing, open alive to another. Exactly. I mean, on that level, there was a woman um, with dementia. I think they call it Lewy body dementia. So it's a kind of dementia where you can experience visions, hallucinations, and so on. And she said to me, um, I've just seen an angel with uh, eyes of flame. Wow. And she is taking me, she is taking me to a birthday funeral. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, well, cool. yeah. I mean, immediately, you know, the death and rebirth thing, you know, incredible. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very enriching sometimes, uh, that kind of work. Yeah, and, and mo going back a little bit, Monty, why does McKilchrist think that capitalism created schizophrenia? Did it, what did it do to reality, or did it fragment us or cut us off from our inner selves? Well, yeah, I think he's saying the emphasis on the left brain and forcing people to live in the world of the left brain. Oh, a brain. linear timeline and all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that that's what does it. it cuts you off from the the broader focus and also also the the right brain is better connected to the emotional centers in the body than the than the left. So um, I've also been getting into a thing called embraining recently, uh, which talks about us having uh, a mind not only in our head brain but also in the heart. Uh, very very soupy kind of that. They're the heart brain and the, and the gut as well, the gut brain, and uh, getting reconnected with you know it's a more part of this bigger sort of embodiment philosophy, uh, which I think is a very positive thing now. So uh, yeah, I've been getting into that too. Wonderful. And you were talking about the lady you spoke to at the at the. Um at the hospital is that in your book when you wrote uh when you were a psychiatric nurse at graylin and uh, graylin this well, yeah. yeah this one graylin well sorry can't do names today but uh, <laughs> this woman bursts into the room and said there will be seven writers who will write a book on the eternal truth and you are one of them is that the lady that was what yes i mean i i I suppose my Sophia is a composite of various women who have, who have uh, there's the one who had the, uh, the visions um, I was talking about earlier. Uh, and this one who I, who just appeared and disappeared. I mean, I never knew her name or anything and uh, that, that does happen. But previous to that, uh, there was a, 
uh, a woman who got the, the how I got into psychiatry was that I was working. I'd been on the dole for a long time during the Thatcher years. You know, there was a lot of people who were unemployed, and uh, we were on a project uh, somewhere work, working on software. I was supposed to. God, I'd had no idea about computers or anything. But I was <laughs> I was the resident artist or, or, or maverick something or other. Anyway, uh, this woman she was. She came into she came into work one morning with this amazing this, this this look in her eyes. I couldn't explain what it was, and she said, "I've got till a quarter to ten to save the universe." She says, <laughs> "And we should smash all these computers. They're evil." And off she went and disappeared. Huh? Uh. What was that? <laughs> what was that about? And I, at that time, I had no idea what psychiatry was or, or had much about psychology or anything. So I later heard she'd been admitted to to a psychiatric hospital, and I thought I have to I have to visit. I have to go and see her, see if I can help or anything, or just just find out what this is about. And uh, so I went to see her, and she was full of all this. She she had amazing imagery uh, uh, in her head you know t- totally she thought she was pregnant with um pregnant by the devil by I being mean, raped by the devil with a new messiah uh <laughs> yeah and she was obsessed with the uh, the joke from um douglas adams the uh, the meaning of life being 42 she was obsessed with this <laughs> And uh, 21 and 21 equals 42. 42 equals question mark. Uh, uh, she kept, re- And this resonated with me very much because when I listened to those Hitchhiker's Guide uh, programs, I, I, there was, I, I was almost pulled into also into this idea of there being a meaning of life, the universe and everything as a, as a serious thing. Because there's a part in the book where or in the series where the, a woman, again, a woman, of course, would be uh, <laughs> sitting in a cafe and she gets enlightened. She gets the the, the thought uh, of what it would all be. And then, of course, the earth is destroyed by the by the right. um, the Vogons, who are very left-brained um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> beings, uh, wanted to control the universe as a bypass, and that was the end of that. But it, it, <laughs> it, that joke you know that there is is it a joke you know there is is there an ultimate meaning to everything to all of it i guess that's what partly what the book's about is <laughs> exploring you know what what could it be what 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 is this <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's the right question i guess i right think question. i know the answer uh, believe it or not uh, i don't all know right. if you've ever heard this you want to hear it all right here it comes 42 <laughs> fortuitous <laughs> fortuitous in other words douglas is trying to say everything the meaning is just like things just happen they're fortuitous and uh, douglas adams did say uh, it did say something like uh stuff happens Uh, yeah (laughs) yeah uh it's all just fortuitous (laughs) <laughs> there is that saying of course shit happens as well which uh, <laughs> i think of um thinking of uh, uh, john bennett and his law of hazard and he's saying that the whole point of that the meaning of the, in the universe can only be because things can go wrong because if everything was perfect and nothing ever went wrong nothing would be meaningful everything would just go straight on you know straight path true that yeah this works this works this works this works this works forever and uh, even God, he says, was subject to the law of hazard. It's the only way that the universe can have meaning is because it can go wrong, <laughs> which is a, quite a mind-blowing thought, really. Yeah. I think it's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very well said. I hadn't, caught of, I hadn't caught of, yeah, fortuitous. Yeah, that's good. I did I did discover later that the no, the number 42 was of some significance to the ancient Egyptians. It so is, uh, yes. you know, maybe it was on onto something on another level as well. <laughs> <laughs> or the CIA did everything. I always blame the CIA oh. or the Archons, Monty. Just that's uh, an easy yeah, path yeah. out. <laughs> uh, cause, yeah, they're, they're very popular at the moment. Uh, if they, you know, that, that's the thing. If they, if there is a, a Illuminati, they, they've got to be evil. They've got, you know, can't be good guys <laughs> trying to help everyone out. You know, <laughs> no, 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 not in this world. Uh, events. Do you have any questions for Monty? Yeah, Monty. Uh, in your travels as a psychiatric nurse, I was wondering if you'd ever encountered any patients that were mysterious in the way that in other words you thought or suspected that they had contact with 
other realities. I mean, other than just sort of ones that were made up in their head, you know, greater realities or tapped into the unconscious um, things that you could, if you listen to them carefully, you could actually learn things. How about that? Well, well, yeah, certainly. I mean, like the one, the one I just met, the one I mentioned with the with the Louis Body Dementia. It definitely seemed as if she was uh, uh, onto something there. Uh, but I think um, I think everybody has this capacity to some extent. I can't say I've come across anybody either as a patient or in in, ge- in general life who I would consider to be enlightened with a big, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It, it, it big uh, capital around it. It just, you know, I haven't met anyone like that. I've met plenty of seekers and uh, plenty of people who, who have amazing insights into things. Uh, but I think it's, yeah, I think it's just like that. It's kind of fleeting. I think I mentioned that in the book as well about how perfection sometimes appears. It's definitely here, but it doesn't last. It appears and disappears, and you have to sort of be aware of it. Uh, yeah, oh, we've got another example there from my work, a woman who has dementia, who just came up to me one day with a big smile on her face and she says, I'm here, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> uh, In the I moment. Mean, that's easy. That's easy to miss. You could go, oh, yeah, oh, she's settled <laughs> today, you know, put it in the notes, she's settled and happy today, blah, blah. This was more than that. This was a moment of sheer sort of joie de vivre. You know, it's like, it's good to be alive, which to me is uh, fantastic, you know, for somebody who's lost so much through dementia to experience that and be able to express it uh, is a real window there. You know, I think, I think we always have to look for these windows where things just are just right and, uh, and remember them when they're gone, you know, as well. That's really well said, and I love it. So, um, why don't we talk about your book itself? Perhaps you could share with the audience. Uh, I'm not going to say you wrote it, but uh, how did it come out of you, Monty? Well, it's, I just, uh, as I described in the, the introduction, I just had this uh, after remembering the the uh, woman who said there were going to be several se- uh, seven writers writing a book on the internal truth. I thought, well, why don't I give it a go? You know, <laughs> so I uh, just had a little purple book by the side of the bed, and every time I felt the inclination, I just write all these thoughts and ideas into it. I didn't. I can't say, you know, I didn't go into a trance or anything like that, as far as I know. Uh, you know, unlike. You know, descriptions of that. What's that? I don't know how you pronounce the name of that. There's an incredible book. Is it Oaspe, uh, the Cosmon Bible? You know that one? Yeah. Really? Oh, my God. Yeah, Vince and I is. went this. We did a show on it, and I, Vince and I had to ask our guests how to pronounce it many times. Uh, yes. I, yeah. Remember I mean, Susan Martinez, uh, Vance? No, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> my okay. memory isn't what it used to be. Too many shows, <laughs> too much time. <laughs> But it wasn't like that. I mean, that's described as, you know, your the, the hand being moved. You know, I was moving my hand, you know, as far as I was going to as far as I knew. But the stuff, you know, I deliberately didn't censor anything. I deliberately just let anything come out the way it did. didn't, didn't sort of uh, correct anything or anything. and just left it there by the bed until the next time I felt I wrote it. And then I wrote it again. So that went on for a few years. And the, the book had been around quite a few years when, uh, before I sent it to Andrew. I just sent it. I didn't think he was I, – I didn't think in terms of publishing it. I just thought he might be interested. So I sent it to him, and he said, oh, I think I'll, I think I'll publish this. Uh, oh, wow, well, okay. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we, we – I mean, he first of all, he did rearrange it, as he describes. We, we, uh, he cut it up into bits because it, it was just written – as is it was it had no the no thematic uh how can you put it uh sort of uh it wasn't organized in in terms of themes or anything like that it was just as it came out in time so he reorganized it into a different form uh and i mean the book does doesn't have a beginning a middle and an end anyway it's all it's all like you know uh all rela- everything relates to everything else in it so we so he did that, and then I came up some some subtitles for for themes that helped make. I think it helps make it more readable rather than just a great big splurge of text. Uh, and then found that there was the images as well that that seemed to go with that. 
so the, yeah, basically that's that's how it was written, and it, it's been around for a few years now. It's it's, it's funny coming back to it now uh, after all this time, as I've kind of moved on and gone into all this other stuff. And you know, like I was talking about the the uh, neurology and uh, study of management of people and NLP and embraining and all kinds of things. Oh, and the study of music. I was studying history of music and philosophy of music and music of the brain, all kinds of stuff. Uh, since then, so it's, it's nice to come back to. Uh, to kind of been reminding myself of, of the Gnostics again. <laughs> and the and the drawings in there are yours. Yes, they are. Yeah, I love them. They're very very powerful stuff. Yeah, your book uh, reminds me again of uh, the Secret Book of John. What they call it, apophatic uh, theology, where you're trying to describe something by not describing them because you're dealing with yeah. obviously something that's ineffable and sublime that is beyond comprehension, but we've experienced in our deepest deepest selves if you would and uh i like how in your in your the stream you have uh of consciousness of tapping into yourself into your soul your cosmology isn't it very much like the hermetic creation story i think uh, in, in i think in hermeticism the sun or the news falls in love with itself like uh the myth of Narcissus, but in yours is what? It's consciousness that falls in love with itself, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to come back to a similar theme over and over again from different angles. Of, uh, I guess it is related to panpsychism and the, the idea of a cosmic consciousness. You know, if there is a consciousness of the whole universe, what would that be like? Would it be what we would call God or would it be something different? Uh, what relationship we would have to us? Uh, There's a lot about the how we view it. It might become what we think it is because it, it allows itself to, or if we allow it to be what it could be, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of a lot of that sort of echoing back and forth between the conscious cosmic consciousness and and our own. Our, I suppose. I mean, I suppose that's really what the cosmic brain is. It's not my brain. It's the brain. It's the the cosmic consciousness exploding in with with meaning with with the paroma. Uh, I suppose that's what I'm coming back to all the time. Uh, I would say so too. And, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of beautiful lines. Again, I liked it a lot. Uh, certainly was inspiring to me, but, uh, uh, here is one quote I took from your book. It goes, God is one, but is also the many. The pleroma is the fullness of manifestations. All thoughts in one thought, each thought in the all. Very nice. Right. I guess I'm thinking of Indra's net as well. There. Right. Yeah, everything reflecting everything else. And also the Sufi image of the of the individual being like a drop in the ocean. Uh, again, the, the, the ocean is made up of, of, of all the small consciousness as one. There's that, that, that significance. We don't have to feel... We're a tiny bit of nothing in the universe, a little bit like, you know, that, that was the Douglas Adams thing that, uh, you know, the, his characters are thrown about all over the place, not knowing <laughs> what the hell's going on. You know, there's, there's, there's something more, something more. We, we, we're meant to be here in, in some shape or form, even if we can't see it. <laughs> it's right. just the, uh, the, was this a revelation that, that, that came to you at some point or just something that you reasoned out? How did that, how did this come to you? God, I don't know. It's a theme, I suppose. Of when I've been reading things, I guess Hazrat Eniat Khan is another one who, uh, you know, reading some of his stuff. His, his stuff is very positive and uh, evocative. That, that yeah, like you're saying, the dot, the uh, and and then reading about Indra's net, and then there's that there's a, a was it the flower arrangement sutra? There's a Buddhist scripture like that as well, where the where you know everything reflects everything else in a positive way, as opposed to uh, the postmodernist business of being stuck in a in a room full of mirrors where where everything signifies as reflecting other signifiers to to you know the to the to infinity and there's no meaning in it <laughs> right yeah that is true and uh you also uh some other lines too i wanted to share with the audience because i i really enjoyed it but uh 
You write, uh, Gnosis is that unfathomable sea itself. So it is, like you said, it is understanding you are part of this eternal consciousness, but like Indra's net that everything is uh, interpenetrated and depends on itself, on each other. Yeah, that's right. As a, it's a, just yeah, finding finding meaning. I suppose in a way. I mean, I, I, when I got into the Gnostics, I was uh, going a little bit against faith uh, and in, in in wanting uh, knowledge, you know, as, as experiential knowledge as opposed to belief. Because beliefs are beliefs are very. We could trap ourselves in beliefs. So once we believe something. Uh, we can inter- be trapped in it because our brain interprets everything that we see and hear uh, in accord with the belief that we're holding. But at the same time, I suppose a basic belief in, uh, the, in the positivity of being and the positivity of being alive, uh, that it is for something. I think Kate Bush said something like, um, or saying, uh, now, now I know I'm needed for the symphony. So uh, like an individual note, in a piece of music is not going to know why it's there. But in, in the piece of music of which it is a part, it makes sense. No, that makes sense. At the same time, Monty, you uh, do write in your book uh, that your book is really an exploration of what is truth. I mean, uh, and of course, there's that scene that I also always find so powerful when Pontius Pilate asks, uh, what is truth? And he walks away from the one person who can answer that question in the Bible. Yeah. So that uh, that was that was very interesting that you put it in there. And this is what your book is about. Yeah, it's a deafening silence that uh, <laughs> what is truth? Oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, <that's it. laughs> four, four minutes 33 of, of, of John Cage <laughs> follows that. Uh, <laughs> and that was that because Jesus uh, didn't know? Or was it because he refused to answer because Pontius Pilate wouldn't be able to take it on board? Or was it because the, the nature of truth in el- itself is in essence silent? You know, it could be there's so many possibilities within. And the, I mean, the Bible is full of words. There's a lot hell of a lot of words and sometimes you wish they were less of them (laughs) (laughs) but that silence that gap is a beautiful uh, like a a light hole (laughs) rather than a black (laughs) hole uh, uh, in there (laughs) that allows for possibility for possibility for vision and for for further progression yeah i would agree with that too um there's this quote also in your book uh the sacred is hidden, occulted in the profane. The significant is hidden in the mundane. I like that a lot because it also, it, for me, it reminded me how the Gnostics were always trying to seek a, a spark, that divine spark in everything. Yeah, and uh, that that's, I suppose that's the way of overcoming possibly the dualism that, that they tended towards because... Uh, dualism is a very is for us now is a very bad thing we've inherited uh, this dualism from from Descartes and from the from the enlightenment and uh, that has led back to Gilchrist again to this left-brained uh, situation which we're all trapped uh, and so it's very bad for us to to view the body as unimportant to view matter as unimportant to view the environment as unimportant you know, I think if anything, we need to. My, my partner, Kirsty, is actually a pagan, and so they venerate nature. They see uh, see sacred in in nature, and I think that's very important to do that now because uh, otherwise we're just going to destroy it and get rid of it. So we can't afford to have to to escape into a sort of disembodied spiritual space that doesn't uh, in connect with the body and with the wisdom of the body and with the wisdom of matter um i mean what is matter <laughs> ultimately uh it's a de- again it's a description we don't know ultimately what stuff is what matter is why matter is why it matters <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's uh, yeah i think it's really so that that thing of the uh, the transcendent being hidden in the imminent, you know, uh, split open a, a piece of wood and lift up a stone, and there I am. Uh, yeah, I see that as very important. 
Yeah, that is true from the old Gospel of Thomas. Uh, and in your work, uh, tell us about who is the demi ego. We all know, but what role does he play? Well, that's a good question. I mean, maybe we can be the demi ego <laughs> a lot of the time. Uh, we could blame it all on God and on of course. <laughs> the God of the Old Testament. Uh, especially at the moment with what's going on in Jerusalem. It was horrendous. You know, just think, my God, why didn't he sort it out? Why didn't you uh, set aside some land for, for Ishmael as well as his, the uh, Isaac, and, you know, and sort, sort it out? Why couldn't you see that this would happen? You know, that's taking it literally, of course. And uh, the, the sort of things that God says in the Old Testament, I am a jealous God, if that jealousy is not really a, a, a <laughs> something we tend to be proud of, you know. It's like saying, I'm insecure. And it's yeah. like, God, insecure? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what, what, what use, you know, what help is there for us if God is insecure? My, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, my God. Uh, <laughs> my God, my God. We're, we're really stuck then, you know. So on a literal level, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, you could even, you could even give credence, I would imagine, to these, uh, you know, these. I, I enjoy watching these ancient alien programs on, on TV. Yeah, they're fun. And you could think, yeah, you think of the, the, the Demiurge could have been a guy in a flying saucer who created all these sort of happenings and events and because, oh, I can, I can get worship from these little guys down here. I can get them all to say how great <laughs> I am, you know. Oh, I enjoy that. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine that on the literal level. But, oh, I, I do hope that cosmic consciousness is not of that nature. But then that is just a reflection of our own bad nature. You know, that, that's, how, that's us when we're, when we're crappy and um, when we, we're not empathic, when we're not, well, again, like the embraining thing, we're not, in, we're not in contact with the heart mind and the gut mind. We're just stuck in the head mind. Or we're just, we're just stuck in our own, our own narcissistic image of ourselves and are not open to the, the bigger picture of things. We can definitely become like a dictator in our, on a, of our own uh, territory. Yeah. Well, that's always a hard question, too, at the end of the day. And, of course, the Gnostics dealt with this, Monty, is, uh, again, we start like your text and many of the Gnostic texts, it's a... Uh, a beautiful expansion of consciousness overflowing this emanation theology that the Gnostics and the Neoplatonists and the Sufis and others had, and it's great. But then the Gnostics says, well, at some point there must have been a breakdown and the ego thought it was the only thing or the Demiurge or these lower gods. Uh, do you ever wonder how does thing or what is your ad? Do things go wrong at some point, or do you think this is just a necessary growth of the divine mind trying to get to know itself? I mean, even Jerusalem and Palestine, or Israel and Palestine, it's all part of it, or what do you think? It's well, a hard question, I, of course. I mean, it is you a, might need a towel a... and number 42 <laughs> to get you through this. <laughs> Yes, yes, a, a nice teddy bear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it is it is very perplexing and very heartrending, and uh, yeah, I I guess also yeah, I was talking about with uh, Andrew again about the again back to the sixties again that the the sixties there did seem to be this uh, real optimism on the horizon and a real sense. And uh, I think a sense, particularly music, had a big part to play back then, the, the feeling that music could transcend human society and people could learn to love each other and be, be kind to one another and respect the planet and all the rest of it through music. I mean, I think it's no surprise that uh, that the, the hippies used to say peace, you know, to one another because, <laughs> I mean, that's what the Sufi used to do before. And uh, to talk about uh, jam, having jam sessions, I mean, jam means gathering, doesn't it, in Sufism? So maybe that's where that comes from. But I think there's a whole ferment of ideas like there was in the around the first century, uh, interesting stuff circulating, and uh, that there was a positive, uh, a positive, possibility in all of that in the 60s but we've lost it now i don't know where it's gone it's not it's not here anymore uh, no. music is no no longer that important to people is it i don't know no. 
Or it's just crap. I don't know. But you're right. I mean, I think I'm sure you would agree that the UK is just has become just as schizophrenic as the United States. Like we're lost in space. Like that Don McLean <laughs> yeah. song, American Pie, we're lost in space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like I was trying to figure out what happened, uh, what in the 21st century to bring this about. And I can only think that it's something to do with social media. I mean, social media, in a way, is a wonderful thing because it can connect people who are miles and miles apart in seconds and they can share ideas and so on. But it hasn't had the positive effect that you would imagine. It seems on the the opposite. It seems to have made people more insular, more paranoid, more insistent on on their ideas and their philosophy and oh yeah we're the people who we're the brexit people we're the people <laughs> who aren't into brexit right. we're the trump people we're the anti-trump people we're the this we're the that either this or either that you know there's no kind of middle ground anymore no what Winnicott would call potential space uh, in the middle where where you know creation can take place i don't understand why that's happened I don't know whether it's the, the back to the Argons again, uh, if they're in charge of it, but uh, it's a it's a pity, whatever. Yeah, it's yeah, like you said, it's suddenly we're seven billion little demiurges trying to control our little kingdoms, and nothing you cannot nothing's acceptable outside of our line of thinking or our little territories. It's uh, yeah, that's I don't, it. We can. We can become an Argon and, uh, and <laughs> convince other people and uh, <laughs> control our, our little bubble. And that's all that matters. There's my little bubble with my <laughs> friends and everyone else can sort Agree of <laughs> with me or, I, yeah, I will block you or leave or insult you on the comment section yeah, or something like that. Disapprove of you, <laughs> upset you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, and what do you think, Vance? Or are you going to blame it on uh, ABBA or Asa Base? <laughs> I think it was disco that did it. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah, that was the start of it. Uh, but seriously, I think what is happening is because of the situation on the planet and the population is growing and so forth, and um, our quote unquote progress is growing, we're creating problems at a rate faster than we can solve them and then everybody starts fighting over the solutions you know the capitalists think oh more progress more money you know more turning people into you know we got to get everybody in the team or whatever and uh and then, and then we got to replace them with machines and then uh you have the uh, the extreme opposite where they oh no we just have to have one overarching government that'll solve all the problems and take it all and that's the big fight i see you know between the um the machine of progress and the bureaucracy of care and and uh, a, a lot of what we lost you know and back in cuz you know I'm old enough to remember the 60s and the, and the 70s and the way it was uh, a lot of that back there wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't present and then the internet has accelerated everything i mean uh, the speed of communications is limitation uh, on things and so we've sped that up and so the whole thing is just going you know headlong the the snowball the rock of sisyphus is rolling down the hill <laughs> faster and faster that's that's my take on it and, and you know the other thing is we don't recognize the realities of consciousness beyond consciousness of the individual I mean, you know, the collective unconsciousness, the egregores, you know, that's still not, not something people are aware of. I mean, there are giant forces of intelligence that are acting, they're, they're, they're collective, they're made out of us, you know, and, and organizations of us through the internet, you know, and then there's a brain, you know, the people that run the planet and so forth. So that's the short answer. That's the way I see it. I think that's a very good answer. I think uh, I forgot who said it recently or what quote, but uh, an abundance of information is a poverty of attention. And I think we've reached that. <laughs> and and everybody's an expert right now. Everybody's an expert on uh, Middle East politics. And a month ago, everybody's an expert at viruses. So, <laughs> yeah, mask, no, the mask no, or not the mask. Yeah. <laughs> to quote, to quote a certain individual, no one knows more about than I do. <laughs> 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 he was fond of saying that, wasn't he? But, but yeah, so that that 
reminds me very much of, I suppose, to come back to evolutional psychology, thinking that we, we still have the same old, you know, physically, we still have the same brain we had way, way back. And it wasn't designed to, to deal with as much information and change and, and everything else as, as we now have. But of course, that, that doesn't, I mean, that explains that, but it doesn't, it doesn't explain the possible of a, of a spark of inspiration of the light from outside of the Plato's cave uh, coming in and, uh, you know, be, of being able to face reality directly. Uh, so that, 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 that the, the spiritual reality seems to be coming more and more buried. And as I, as I say, is I suppose another thing is there's a danger of, of spiritual narcissism as well, of, like you say, becoming an expert. Or, no <laughs> one knows more about Gnostics than I do. <laughs> uh, the danger of that, uh, because, I mean, as soon as you're an expert, then you can't let any light in anymore. Right. You've got it. <laughs> yeah, you're so, never learning, never yeah. growing. Yeah. And do you exactly, feel yeah. uh, you, do deal this, this, you do deal with this in your book, Monty? Do you think postmodernist thinking might have uh, made things worse. I think you, you quote the great Ken Wilbur who feels it's created narcissism and nihilism across the world, even if it can be useful. Well, that's right. It, is, it seems to have trapped us, like I said, trapped us in this uh, world of, of mirrors, mirror space. Uh, that was it, Baudrillard, isn't it? Sort of Im images reflecting other images. and uh, Yeah, you have to find a way out of that one uh it's just otherwise we, we we do build our own prisons we can build our own prisons prisons of ideas like you said before mind forged manacles we apply them we build we, we build our own prisons and we stick ourselves in there why do we do that <laughs> you know we could build other stuff we can build venues you know like the like the devils who are thrown down into hell you know in in milton the bigger big build a big venue and do a gig in it you know pandemonium <laughs> <laughs> you know if they had a bad situation you might as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah well here we are that's what we're trying to figure out and in your work monty um how does the resurrection take place you do talk about this i think it's uh in in perception i think it's a resurrection of of, of understanding rather than the literal thing. Uh, I, I think these, like I was saying, these prisons we create for ourselves uh, can be can be dissolved, can be can be dismantled. Maybe this could be a, a spiritual version of deconstruction. You know, uh, I think that, that that to me would be the resurrection of the, the of, of a new vision of an, another way of seeing reality, of a new way of seeing relationships and things, and how how to live in the here and now really yeah definitely an inspirational message we need this more than ever and as we start getting towards the end of the interview monty uh what are some of the gnostic gospels that speak to you or that inspire you or maybe beyond your book you think others should read i think we talked about the gospel of thomas any other ones yeah, definitely Gospel of Thomas. I keep thinking of uh, Thunder Perfect Mind. I really oh, yeah. like that. That's so full of anything that's full of par paradoxes. I like I like paradoxes, and I think the paradoxes are a good way out of of dogmatism and left brainness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it, it, I'm very fond of that saying of uh, of James Joyce's two thinks at a time. Uh, to be able to hold two two oppositions at the same time. I knew to about the reconciliation of op opposite reconciliation of opposites as well. So yeah, I mean, any yeah, so many. God, I'm trying to think of all the all these texts. There's so many now. I like the hymn of the pearl. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a very beautiful. I mean, that that appears again in Sufi literature as well. Uh, from the the the, the, the acts of Thomas, isn't it that one? Mm -hmm. right. uh, but that that being being reminded of. Of being of of something more of having come from somewhere better, uh, again like Rumi's uh, the the story of the the reed being pulled from the reed bed and uh, being made into the flute and the sad sound it makes reminds it of being in the reed bed, you know going back again yeah the pleroma where we belong where we come from where we we want to return to, 
Uh, yeah, any any of those sort of just those there's just, just so much. I mean, that's the thing about now uh, is that we have so much access to information. Just home in on the good stuff, you know. <laughs> there's plenty of it, so there's no there isn't really any excuse not to, not to tap into good stuff. You just look for it and find it. Seek and you will find. There it is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, split a piece of wood, lift up the rock, and Jesus will be there. And uh, what about uh, Sophia? I think you said you had a Sophianic encounter while you were doing art therapy. Who is Sophia to you in your personal life? I think Sophia is a composite figure, just of different women who have inspired me at different times uh, in my life. It always seems to be women, but I always think women have a, uh, a bigger dimension than than blokes to uh, tend to be left less left brain than blokes tend to be. We tend to be a bit of an obsessive kind of uh, <laughs> yes lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they always bring in somehow bring in an extra element that we hadn't thought of the the animal figure of, of uh, that uh, Jung speaks of. I don't know if we're like that for them. I I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to <laughs> ask a few. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And Vince, do you have any last questions as we uh, wrap things up? I well, think... <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I was sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. If you have questions, Monty, <laughs> well, I'll answer your question, or maybe you want to answer your own questions. Your your two brains are starting <laughs> to work and unify. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to ask a little about autism, uh, and if you had any experience with that, and if you think uh, what the spiritual implications of autism are. Yeah, go. That's a big question as well. I mean, some people have speculated whether I might have uh, had autism or been might be autistic. Uh, certainly, the certainly I had the experience, and I suppose of uh, not being of feeling like other people. I couldn't understand other people, and they couldn't understand me. It was as if everybody was playing some sort of game, that, and they all knew what the rules were, and I didn't. Uh, this is when I was younger. And it was really going. It was getting into nursing that that uh, helped me to to really develop uh, sort of understanding of communication and so on. Uh, and I mean, music also helps to unify the two sides of the brain as well. It builds the corpus callosum. Uh, my nephew has uh, autism. He has um, Asperger's, so they, they might might well run in our family there. Uh, I think the thing about autism is that unlike it's different to uh, someone who's a sociopath or a sociopath has no empathy and doesn't it doesn't matter to the sociopath because the sociopath is interested in control and manipulation and so on. Whereas autistic people really do want to connect with people and understand people and to be understood by people. Uh, they, they have a, a genuine desire uh, for that. And I think I'm sure that, spirituality would play a part in that too yeah. uh, but it, it's a huge it's a huge again a huge subject uh, that could be explored you know it could be a whole book in itself <laughs> autism and spirituality i don't know if uh, anyone has written that yet <laughs> yeah well thank you that those are good insights thanks yeah i would agree too well, Monty, as we get to the end, for those who want to find out more about you, uh, do you have a personal website or where can they look for you on the Internet? Yes, so, so I do have a website uh, run, for, uh, run for me by my good friend Henry. Uh, it's uh, Um uh, I also have, I'm building up now a band camp. Uh, Monty Oxymoron Bandcamp site, which I, I've just put some stuff on there yesterday, and there's all sorts of music on there. I I, I think I'm aiming to produce the most eclectic Bandcamp uh, site ever. You know, <laughs> just create from the from the very sublime and beautiful and spiritual to the absolutely ridiculous and crazy and and uh, uh, <laughs> just sort of total nonsense. You know, everything on there. So please have a look at that. Uh, I'm also building up 
stuff on YouTube. I, I'm sort of playing various things on there, include, including the bridge up the road. I did a piece based on the uh, playing the the, bar, the railings of, of the bridge, which had particularly pleasing sound. Uh, oh, cool. So yeah, and I end up a Facebook uh, page as well. So there's pl- plenty, plenty out there <laughs> for people to look at. And wonderful, yeah. You you will find him, and uh, you will enjoy his content. And I definitely highly recommend the Cosmic Brain Explodes. Uh, but we are at the end. First, I'd like to say, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company. And I hope you are well. I hope you're damned actually, and you go listen to the music. <laughs> Very good. I listened a little bit of it uh, on on. Uh on monty's site so it was good and monty uh, appreciated being here appreciated you sharing your gnosis very interesting no thank you very much it's, it's an honor and a privilege yes monty thank you very much for coming on am bide giving us your time and uh sharing your ideas which were wonderful and good luck with your book and all your other artistic expressions well thank you very much And there you have it, my beloved True Seekers. The entire interview with Monty Oxymoron for everyone. As a petite celebration for 15 years doing Gnostic podcasting. Cool stuff from Monty. It ain't over though. Let us to Tobias Churton with some relevant and cool revelations on John Lennon and rock music in general. You write, uh, which I was floored, and you said that uh, a very little-known fact was that John Lennon said that the true Christians were the Gnostics? Yes. So he knew about yes. Gnosticism. Whoa. John Lennon, oh, of course, he would have. I mean, in London in 1967, there was a, a thing, I think it was called the Free School, and don't quote me on that particular name, but it was like something like the London Free School. And it was around Notting Hill in the area where Pink Floyd, were, the Pink Floyd, as they were called, then were playing. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you speak to people who were in that area at that time, people were giving talks on on, on Gnostic religions. It's quite interesting. Really? So it was it was in the air in the mid '60s in London. And of course, uh, Lennon had also read Sconfield's The Passover Plot, uh, which has some sort of Gnostic shades in it. But um, I don't know what exactly he'd read. I mean, I know that Yoko Ono was interested in Kabbalistic symbolism at some stage, and his reading, John Lennon's reading in the 60s was highly, you could say, spiritual speculative, was a big interest of his, always had been. Not something he could talk to the teen magazines about, but he'd always had a sort of an eye on that strangeness. I remember having dinner with Bill Harry, who, who was at college with him in Liverpool and used to run a paper called Mersey Beat, and he said that the Lennon he knew in Liverpool was interested in anything strange or out of the way of spiritual, um, you know, they're all interested in what happens when you die, and can you speak to the dead, and they're seriously interested in there's more to the human, the dimensions of the human being than is apparent to the eye. I think that was just the feeling they had, and they expressed it in art or, or, or just the way they were. I mean, Lennon always said he had this psychedelic vision. He'd had it since he was a child that he saw through things very quickly and saw through people, tended to have uh, see people's souls and that sort of thing. And um, you know that he was it was a spiritual vision that he had, but he he he'd sort of had, got sick of it in the sort of about '65 period, and he had a big argument with in his own mind with uh, Catholic concepts, which you can hear in those early songs. But the quote you're talking about comes from a book called Skywriting by Word of Mouth, which he wrote in the late 70s and which wasn't published till 1986. And there's a wonderful little chapter in it called The Mysterious Smell of Roses. And uh, he talks about a, a discussion he had with the childminder, I think it was, Helen, I think. Um, and uh, they were talking about spiritual religion, which he was apparently always talking about when given the chance, given the right company. And he then uh, talked to, yes, he said the only true Christians were the Gnostics. And then Yoko put a footnote in and he said, well, we know that we, he, he wasn't saying that the Dead Sea Scrolls were Gnostic. Or it, was, it was a little footnote about it. But they, he, they were aware of the Gnostic tradition. And uh, I think he did an interview with Playboy magazine very shortly before his, that he was murdered. 
uh, where he talked about this, he said there's always this group that emphasizes the self-self, and he said there's Sufis, there's the Gnostics. So he was very aware of that. But it wasn't something he was going to go on a on a bandstand and announce to the world, because he, he already knew what happened. You know, if you speak publicly in the very broad pop culture sense about these things, you know, ev every lunatic uh, is immediately ignited by this kind of uh, thought and feels that they're everything they know is true and good is imperiled and, they, you know, they, can't, they, they get hysterical, you know. So it, it, it was a quiet thing. I think, I think people who are really into his music could probably feel the presence, even though if it wasn't referred to directly. Yeah, imagine no heaven or hell, that's right out of uh, Gnostic. Yeah, thought. but of course he didn't mean what, it, I know, but he didn't mean what people think he meant. By oh, it. I agree. <laughs> so, you know, so many of those things that, you, you know, I, I'm not sure he was ever very, to, you know, for all that song. It's so easy to misinterpret that song in two or three ways, I would say, imagine. I think it probably upset him a bit. That's a guess. You know, imagine no heaven, no heaven. What was he saying? Was he saying we're better off without religion or we're better off without a certain kind of religion? You know, it's, it's very difficult to say. What was in his mind that day in 1971? You know. I, th I, I would, I'd love to have had a chat with him about that. Oh. <laughs> I think he'd have got, I think he'd, I suspect he'd have got a bit hot, hot under the collar because, I, again, the moment you try to write down a mystical insight, it look, to somebody who hasn't had that insight, it, it, it reads completely differently to the way you had, you felt it when you wrote it. It's always a great problem with writing. I mean, there are religious Gnostic traditions in the world that will not write, you know, for fear that, the writing becomes worshipped and the, the, the experience is ignored. Maybe we have too many writings, religious writings. You know, we rely too much on these things. I, I really wonder what the, the attitude of the original Gnostics was to their, to their Gospels. Were they sort of throwaway jobs like, oh, well, I came up with this one yesterday. I mean, I wouldn't like to start a church on it, but it seemed true at the time. <laughs> You know, I don't think they wanted them wrapped in gold and look at these precious words that must last for eternity. <laughs> they were insights at the time, you know, notes on the way, diary entries. Snapshots of the know. soul and then... If you like, yeah. You know, there are many more Gnostic Gospels still to be written, never mind discovered. And there you have it again, my beloved true seekers. Thank you, Tobias. And now... Let us play a clip from Gary Lockman. It's longer and broader as Gary discusses the bicameral mind and other alternative psychologies. All that complement what Monty said and give you some understanding on perhaps how to reverse the terrible fragmentation of the human psyche in the 20th and 21st century. Hello and goodbye, as always. Indeed, and it, it does make perfect sense, uh, as you were mentioning about the suppression of Hermes, the suppression of Sophia, the esoteric, that sort of, uh, and uh, David Feidler has written about it, led to Newton, and uh, this is a bit ironic because Newton was an alchemist, <laughs> and it led to Descartes, and even though Descartes got his ideas in a dream, these two <laughs> figures really were part of the stream or the architects to give us this uh, left brain world that we're still lingering in, right? Mm. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, that's one of the, well, that's one of the ironies, of course, the, the whole thing about Newton is that, I mean, in many ways, the what what uh, what we revere Newton for and, and what um, the, the work of Newton that more or less, you know, led to the modern world was something that he kind of did on the side in many ways. It was kind of, um, you know, coincidental um, uh, uh, to his main concerns, which were alchemy and also, you know, biblical exegesis and, and trying to understand the secret messages of the Bible and things of that sort. And, and kind of, uh, uh, he was, he, he actually wrote like predictions, sort of like Nostradamus and he predicted, you know, um, future events and things of that sort. So I'm not taking away in any way from his very important scientific work in optics and, and uh, laws of motion and, 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 and so on. But in a way, uh, it was kind of something that happened in the context of all these other things as well. And as you say, you know, Descartes, um, uh, too, he, you know, Descartes, uh, the story about him is he was one of the ones who tried to uh, make contact with the Rosicrucians 
um, when uh, the notices of you know the, the Rosicrucian Brotherhood started to appear in 1614 in, in Cassel in, in Germany. And, uh, you know, uh, news of them spread through Europe like wildfire. And uh, Descartes uh, wanted to, um, you know, meet with them and he tried, but he couldn't, he couldn't find them as well. So, yeah, I mean, there, there, it, 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 there's all these sort of, you know, strange blends and combinations of, of, of the two sorts of things. And yes, you know, uh, as you said, Descartes uh, uh, was uh, given, you know, um, many ideas in, in, in his dream and, 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 and so on and so on. Um, but there does seem to be a kind of very strong shift at that time. Uh, obviously, uh, rejecting this earlier kind of, of uh, more uh, holistic, image-based, you know, sy symbolic. Um, uh, I mean, the Hermetic tradition um, is, is it's much more uh, so poetic, deals with metaphor, uh, as you say, imagery, um, in intuitive. Uh, as a, you know, and it also, it, you know, it, 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 see, it treats the world, the universe, as a living being, a, a sentient being that, you know, one can... Um, you know, commune with one, one can have um, interact with, as we like to say today. Whereas the the um, the scientific view, which um, had to develop this way, it's not evil that it did. It's not bad that it did. We wouldn't be able to be having this conversation if it didn't. Okay. Happen. Uh, it's just the thing is that um, it, it its success is predicated on, as you said, the repression of you know the 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 the, the more intuitive. Um, and um, if you look at it as I do in the book, because another philosopher uh, who uh, was, uh, sort of historical vision I draw on uh, to sort of tell the narrative is the German Swiss um, philosopher Jean Gebser, who uh, was, uh, in the last century, the 20th century, died in the early 70s, um, that he wrote a fantastic book called The Ever Present Origin. And um, without going into too much about it, he has a whole kind of history of consciousness that he sees, sees in terms of what he calls these different structures of consciousness um, that um, all emerge from something that he calls origin, which is a kind of, well, it's very difficult to talk about. It's kind of very primal, primary, uh, non-manifest dimension of being, something like the Gnostic Pleroma, we could say, you know, uh, right. but, uh, but, uh, uh, these structures emerge, and the, the the sort of narrative, the the movement is further and further away from this this kind of primal source, and um, uh, consciousness becomes less and less connected to it, and more attenuated, until finally, uh, by the time you reach what he calls the mental rational structure, it's completely you know separated from from its source, and it sees the it sees the world as alien, um, much in the way that the left brain. Um, dominated view sees the world because it's 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 cut itself off from its own kind of um, interconnection to things, and it it it, it's, it sees this world that's completely other, you know, completely outside itself. Uh, and again, you have the Cartesian separation between, you know, the thinking, the thinking thing, thinking being, and the extended being, you know, and then you have the whole Cartesian dualism that has plagued, you know, the Western mind uh, ever since. Um, and um, so. Uh, Gebser's whole um, kind of vision um, sees this uh, mental rational structure as much in the same way that McGilchrist sees a kind of um, left brain dominated um, sort of consciousness. Uh, but and, and for Gebser though, that, that consciousness is starting to break down. It's starting to kind of disintegrate. Um, it, 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 in the modern Ter terms it came into like full force at precisely this time at the rise of, of what we call modern science um, and um, but it's sort of become overripe by now and uh, so what the story I'm telling is from I'm, 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 I'm sort of the narrative of the book uh, begins with laying out these ideas I've just been talking um, with you now about, and then I have a chapter where I, I, I talk about the, uh, the ancient wisdom in, this, in the sense that there's this whole notion that's at the root of um, practically all of the mystical or esoteric or magical uh, hermetic you know, uh, traditions in the West, that there was some you know, primal, primal wisdom some some you know ancient teaching, um, ancient knowledge that um, humanity once possessed, you know, but we we've somehow lost. Um, and I'm I'm 
more or less saying that that this this in a way is a kind of memory or or, or metaphor or some kind of symbol of this earlier more right brain kind of consciousness that that um, you know we we had and we uh, um, we were more connected to things we were more connected to nature it's something that in another book I speak of as participatory consciousness in, in a book of mine called the secret history of consciousness and there's there's a lot of parallels in the uh, drawn I mean I'm I, you know I'm basically working out the same idea in, in different ways in different books but in any case so that's kind of the beginning so I, so I, I look into some ideas what does this ancient wisdom mean how can we understand it what's some examples of it today and so on and so on and then after those that chapter I get into the whole the actual historical narrative starting with sort of the ancient Greek mysteries and all that and um, it, it, you can see along the way up until uh, the rise of science um, the main kind of uh, struggle let's say or antagonism or drama put it that way uh, is between um, <clears throat> kind of pagan philosophies in terms of say Greek philosophy Plato just just to give one name to cover all of that and and Christianity that that there's a real there's a real struggle there um, because uh, that that's a very interesting one uh, I found as I was doing the book so was, even though I knew about this I didn't you know you know one one knows it and then when you sort of go in and you do all the reading and consecutively you start to really get an idea of it and this this was something that's actually you know remarkable I, I think about our whole the whole past the western past in the sense that there were you know quite a few times when uh it looked like the hermetic platonic kind of intuitive whatever you want to call it uh um tradition would would somehow find a way into the into the main kind of you know Christian um, kind of world, and uh, one wonders what how things would have been. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I I just I just basically tell the story in terms of different individuals. So you know, there's the early I say took the Greek mysteries and then Pythagoras, and then into Plato, and then later on to the neo Neoplatonists, and then so on and so on. The, the whole Hermetic kind of uh, diaspora after the fall of Alexandria. And um, the movement to the east, and and, and the Arab development. On, I devote uh, a good chapter to uh, um, the uh, sort of Persian uh, Gnostic uh, Platonist philosopher Suwarwardi, who uh, was written about uh, quite a bit by Henri Corbin. Um, and uh, yeah, he was someone I hadn't had a chance to talk about in other books, so it was um, interesting. So, and and that, that's another sort of theme that comes up in the book too: this kind of inner journey, the inner the inner journey, the the, the Gnostic voyager, you know, the voyage within. And so you have, you know, this happens in Dante, it happens in Suwarwardi, it happens in 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 uh, Jung later on, and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of obviously it's a big book. There's a lot of stuff going on at this. So there's there's the a main his, kind of historical narrative and story, and then there's you know sort of tributaries. Um, no, this it's it's I say I'm thinking about it myself. It's actually you know it, it, there's and without ever once having to resort to any kind of conspiracy theory or anything like that. This is just stuff that's just available. You know, if you kind of just read it, it's not you don't have to hunt and and uncover the truth about anything. It's just there. You know. And again, why why does it never go away? You know, uh, at least in my lifetime, you know, a variety of different scientists and rationalists have debunked all of this once and for all, and it always raises its um, you know head all the time. And it does so because it's part of us. You know, it's 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 fixed into our our, our physiology, our 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 our, our neural uh, you know network. Um, so it's something that we're never going to get rid of. We have to understand it. Yeah, your book is spanning, and for the reader, again, it's a whole historical journey. Uh, there, there are things that, again, most people should know, like William Blake condemning Newton. There are things most people might not know, like the irony that Newton ended up working for a bank that wanted <laughs> to prosecute an alchemist, which I read yeah. in your book. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that most people might not want to, might not know about. Mm -hmm. For example, and I found so many things that to me were very interesting. One is about man's relationship with nature, because you say, well, man was more embedded in nature, but you actually argue that's not really the case. And you bring up a, a, a gentleman named Petrarch, I believe, oh, Petrarch. who was the first person who actually dug nature. Well, I mean, in in, in the sense of. Um, I mean, obviously, man was aware of nature, you know, for the longest time. And um, but um, 
Petrarch uh, was an um, Italian poet, uh, probably you know the most important poet after after Dante, and up, along with being you know a very famous poet and 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 writing um, you know wonderful um, um, you know um, works of literature, um, he also was one of the first people to climb a mountain purely to see the view. Um, and, and this was this, what thirteenth uh, century. It was yeah, thirteen yeah, thirteen thirteen sixties, I believe. And this was something uh, uh, that was unheard of at the time. Now, obviously, people had you know climbed over hills and mountains for a variety of other things, but to, to do it just to see the view was considered mad. And many historians um, see this as the first sign of what became sort of full blown a few centuries later in 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 the Romantics, where Nature in the wild becomes something that suddenly is, is seems you know absolutely uh, you know uh, tremendously beautiful and and awe inspiring and and stupendous. Um, whereas before, nature in the wild was something that you know everyone wanted to get away from. You know, uh, it was <laughs> it, it, well, it was the wild. It, it was it was living as savages. You know, uh, I mean, um, in the say in the, in the Early 18th century, um, you know, a well t- a well tended garden, a topiary. You know, everything was sort of you know neatly um, uh, humanized in many ways. You know, because if you look at the gardens of Versailles and places like that, it's all very geometric. It's, there's 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 patterns and all that. But with sort of um, if you want to if you want to place you know the uh, say Goethe with um, uh, the sorrows of young Goethe, which is this you know uh, novel of of uh, one of the first novels of this kind of unrequited love that that basically drives um, this uh, young man into these these uh, ecstasies of both joy and despair, and and he he feels alienated by society, and he only feels you know himself out out in the wild, out and out 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 in nature and all that. And obviously, before that, you have you have Rousseau, but in a way, the nature that we kind of go out of our way to get to now. You know, we spend a lot of money to go to the mountains or into the jungle or something like that. A few centuries ago, that would have just been considered absolutely mad. That was something that you know, <laughs> was wasn't on our radar. And so, yeah, it, it's an example of um, someone who talks about this quite a bit is um, a wonderful um, writer and philosopher of language, a fellow named Owen Barfield, and I talk about him in the book. And um, uh, he's he's uh, I've written about him. Uh, at length in my I said earlier book, Secret History of Consciousness, and um, he was uh, he was a great friend of C.S. Lewis. He was he was among the crowd that was known as the Inklings in Oxford. Um, Tolkien was another one in there, and Charles Williams, and so. But he was also um, a, a keen uh, uh, sort of philosopher of literature and, and and poetry and language. And he basically argued that the kind of nature that that it doesn't mean you know. It doesn't mean we actually make the rocks and trees and flowers, but the way we see it, the way we understand it, um, the way it's become symbolic of kind of freedom, you know, uh, or I don't know, a variety of different goods that we 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 now see reflected in it. Uh, this is a relatively recent sort of development. I mean, obviously, nature was you know part of human life for the longest time. Uh, you know, obviously, if, if, if only for you know agriculture and 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 food and growing and things of that sort, and obviously the nature gods and all that. But the idea for nature in itself, as a, as as awe inspiring, as as almost erotic, uh, uh, the kind of, the the kind of um, sensuous delight. In, in natural settings and scene and scenery that the romantic poets have is very much like um, uh, kind of it, it's 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 almost like kind of cosmic sex in in, in a certain way to put to put it to put it uh, uh, in a sensational way. So again, so I mean that that's one of my you know themes that I work on in different books that you know our, our consciousness has evolved uh, over uh, over time over history. It's changed. You know the way the way uh, an ancient Egyptian sees the world or saw the world is very different than the way we see it. And, and one of the people who, one of the esoteric thinkers I draw on quite a bit in the book was René Shrala de Lubitsch, uh, you know, the maverick Egyptologist and alchemist uh, who most people probably know of him through Graham Hancock's books because he's the one who said this, the, you know, the Sphinx was, you know, probably 10,000 years old or something like that. And, and, and it was, um, it had marks of water erosion on it. And that, that, you know, that let the kid out of the bag for, for many a book, but, uh, Shual de Lubitsch, you know, the way he talked about how ancient Egyptians, how their consciousness was. And he talks about what he calls something called the intelligence of the heart, which again, is much more intuitive. It's a much more immediate kind of participatory 
way of being in the world. It doesn't it, do, it doesn't see the outer world as something completely other and completely discreet and set apart from the inner world. Uh, it it uh, the 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 barrier separating the two is permeable. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I I relate uh, Shmuel Lubitsch's ideas about this intelligence of the heart to a more right brain kind of perception. And also I bring in people like the French philosopher Henri Bergson, his ideas about intuition. Uh, again, all, all these kind of things, these uh, different perspectives on the same sort of phenomena uh, lead me to think that this is, you know, we're talking about something that's real, something that's actual um, in, in our experience and, and has been charted by by different people at different times. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, the, the way, you know, one reason why we don't really understand, let's say, what the Egyptians were doing is because our perception of the world, our consciousness of the world is very different than theirs. And likewise, um, people in the Middle Ages, their consciousness would be different. So Petrarch is an example of this new modern kind of consciousness where in, in a way he's, he's separating himself from the world. Uh, in the medieval time, if you look at tapestry, you know, it's it's uh, uh, well. This this is the thing for for Gebser, Petrarch um, is sort of the beginning of perspective, and this was the great shift in 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 the Renaissance for perspective. Where before, you know, if you if you painted something, um, the way you saw the background, it didn't have anything to do with how we actually see it. It had to do with what was important. So even though if a church was far away, it would look bigger in the painting because it was more important. It had more significance, more meaning. And uh, the, the, the idea of, you know, trying to accurately represent how we perceive the world uh, wasn't sort of the motive behind the painting. But with the shift from medieval time into the Renaissance, it's as if the tapestry suddenly became, you know, from 2D it becomes 3D in a certain way. And you get this separation um, from, and, 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 and you get the world seen from, from a particular point of view, a particular perspective. Ergo, you know the, the rise of, 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 of uh, perspectivism, and this this was a very important point in in human um, history of human consciousness or Western consciousness for for Gebser and and Petrarch's ascent of Mont Ventoux, which is the mountain in, in in southern France. That now it's very easily accessible. It's you know this 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 you know lifts and and it's it's on the Tour de France route, but uh, back in the day when Petrarch went up there, you know he was just considered mad to do it. But when he got to the top, he just saw, you know, like the old Who song, I could see for miles and miles. He just saw for miles and miles. And this was something that, you know, he wasn't prepared for. He had he had this kind of huge experience up there. Um, and um, uh, if you ever get a chance, his, his, the letter, he has a letter that he wrote to his father confessor. Because all the time he's up there, he's saying, you know, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be dazzled by the beauties of the world. I should be focused on God and the spirit and all that. But he, he can't help himself but be captivated by these new perspectives that he sees and these far horizons and all that. And this is the beginning for, for Gebser of, of our own modern kind of consciousness, which, you know, sees ourselves as separated, you know, from the world. The world is something out there that we look at. Uh, and that's a very left brain, you know, and obviously science and so many other things, you know, come out of that. And it has great value, but uh, as I said, the the uh, downside is that it it can lead to you know this alienation, the sense of existential you know angst, being lost in the cosmos. We we know we don't we don't feel rooted in the world anymore. And um, both uh, Gebser in his way, and McGilchrist say you know we're basically at a time when it's 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 palpably obvious that you know these two opposite kind of perspectives. Uh, ways of seeing the world need to be, you know, somehow brought together. And that's what the whole Western esoteric tradition in many ways is, is, is about. All right, we're not done yet. One more missive, one more goodbye. To truly end, I'd like to share a tune by the talented and intense and very arcane Orion Swift. The song is Road to Freedom. And cover your ears if you're a Karen-ass clencher, because it's chock full of gnosis and graphic and lyrics. For more on Orion, please visit Origin of Orion Dad Cam. Awesome tune, and this is the end, my friend, as the door sang, on a small celebration here in the desert of the real. 
there's something going on in the streets. Nobody seems to want to talk about it. So let's talk about it. Real talk, condos in the city aren't being bought up by the one percent. Empty, they sick us. Fellow guys and goddesses are forced from their homes, living paycheck to paycheck. Take a step back, look at the city streets. Notice how many of us live in tech communities. When you're ringing red, scoff says you walk past. More and more displays, cause they can't be the rest. I get my heart. Satterboard, Capricorn, I'm the tax man and I've come to collect But you got more important things to do like staring at your screens uh, Man swipes right on a pretty little thing She passes on a gig of dopamine and addicted to the feeling She's just another notch on her self-esteem count I know now I learned from my dad selling tickets to our shows on the Emerald City streets. All you need to know now is I'm the next big thing with my unique sound. But for now, I sell my blood. (laughs) 